right, we're here with Mel Thomas, UConn legend. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. <laughs> so exciting. Okay, full disclosure, I'm a huge fan of your book, Heart of a Husky. Um, it, I've read it like 30 times. It's 30 times? Amazing. Yes. It's so good. It's awesome. It's amazing. Thank you. I'm so glad you liked it. Okay, so you played at UConn from 04 to 08, um, and I guess you've been out for what, 13 years at this point? Gosh, I can't believe it's been that long, but yes. Is yes. It, it's wild. Um, talk a little bit about why you chose UConn in the first place. Like what stood out in your recruiting process? Um, I think obviously just the winning tradition gets your gets your attention in the first place. But once I started to learn more about the program, it was just the the way they did things was different than a lot of other programs. Uh, when coach was recruiting me, he didn't really sugarcoat anything. He didn't promise anything. He was just real. And I appreciated that. And I'm a big believer in just following your gut instinct. And when yeah. I went on my, um, on my campus visit, I was like, yep, this is it. This is where I want to go. And it just, everything felt right. The, it was very much a family atmosphere and everything was authentic on some of my other visits some of it seemed a little more rehearsed a little staged yeah. Oh, yeah. Real. and I just fell in love with the program the coaches just everything about it so what uh what's the recruiting process like for people who don't really understand the recruiting process well I've been out of it for a few years now so a lot has changed because of social media and just the way the world is now. But when I was being recruited, um, there was a lot of actual mail, which I don't think that you, they probably sent much anymore. But so when I was probably seventh grade ish is when I first started receiving actual letters in the mail and they couldn't contact you by phone, I think until you're going into your junior year, maybe. Okay. And so then there was one day when everything opens up. So you, you just get like a million calls that one day and it's just like overwhelming and you don't know who to weed out, who to talk to. You want to talk to everybody. It's just, it's a very overwhelming process. And my mom was the one that kind of like kept everything yeah. organized for me. She was like way more into it than I was. She was like, this person called you and this person called you. And I was like, uh, I, I don't even know what to think of all of this. So it's definitely an overwhelming process, but as it went on, you started to build really cool relationships with a lot of people. And you know, come full circle later in life. Some people that were recruiting me, I either, you know, coached against them later or came in contact with them later. And they, it was just cool to build those relationships with a lot of people. So even the places where I didn't end up going, I built a lot of great relationships and there were a lot of great people out there. Talk about the home visit with Gino. You detail that in your book where he just props his feet up on your table, drinks all your wine. I mean, he, he's a character, right? He sure is. Um, it was, the thing is, he makes you feel comfortable. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, maybe a little too comfortable, but I don't, I don't think there's such a thing as too comfortable. But I just think everything he does is very real. And that's, you know, what attracted me so much to him and to the program is that he just, you know, he's a straight shooter. And so I definitely just appreciated that. And having him in your house is a little, you know, as a high school kid is a little overwhelming at first. Yeah. Oh yeah. In a couple of seconds, everything feels comfortable and he, he's an awesome guy and easy to talk to. And, you know, it was, it was a cool experience. So Chris Daly is his assistant. She's been with him since 85. So talk a little bit about her and her influence and some of the rules that she sets in place. Um, CD is really the one that like makes that program go. Yeah. You know? the one that pays attention to all the details and she's the one that sometimes could be annoying at practice because she was telling you to touch every line and tuck your shirt in and you know all the little details that you think are stupid especially yeah. when there but then you realize that all those little details add up and then that creates the final product of the program so she's the one that was made you pay attention to all of those things and she just compliments him so well and they have just such a good thing going there and she's the best I actually she was in Florida a few days ago and I actually just had lunch with her so, so fun shout out to CD and Gino he is the best um it was it was great to see her and 
I'm just so fortunate that I had both of them as my coaches. So talk about her fashion sense. We got to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> oh, CD is a queen. I mean, she's just always like head to toe, dressed to perfection, and everybody knows it. And it's amazing. It's just part, it's just part of her persona, you know, it's just CD. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, do you have an impersonation of her or Gino? Oh, gosh. No, I'm not going to put myself in that situation. Um, they're both wonderful and I don't want to impersonate either of them because even though I'm working years out, I'm still, I'm still not having them come for me. <laughs> uh, you mentioned superstition in your book. Talk a little bit about pregame superstitions that you or the team had, especially in that period of time where you were put under some pressure to win a championship. Um, I think just as an athlete, it is a normal thing to want to want it to be the same way every single time now it's not like if we don't do this we're going to lose it's not like crazy superstition like that but you get in a routine that almost becomes like scientific and you do the exact same thing at the exact same time every day wear the same things it's just part of your preparation for the game so i think it just kind of gets you in the mental space of doing the exact same thing every single day and um, some of them are just, you know, stupid. You eat at this time, you, um, I mean, all the way down to the warm up. everything's down to the exact minute and what playlist you might listen to, things like that. Um, so talk about a day in the life of a UConn player for non-game days versus game days, because you talk a little bit about it in your book where you have pregame meal, shoot around, all that stuff, but there's so much more that goes into your day. I think as a student athlete. Yes. Um, I'm trying to go back in the memory bank here to remember exactly, you know, how each day was, but basically if we were on the road, you would get a wake up call and then you would go to team breakfast. We'd go over maybe a little bit of the scouting report there. And then you would go back to your room. We'd usually um, go to, or go to shoot around in the morning. And then we'd have our pregame meal. And then somewhere in there, we'd always go on a team walk because they just didn't want you sitting in your room all day. So that was something we would do. We would go on a, a team walk outside, just to get some fresh air, get to, just to get moving. Um, and then you'd go to the game the exact same amount of time before. So you could have the exact same pregame routine um, every single time. Our pregame meal was exactly the same meal every time. And um, it was just, it was very, you know, repetitious. So. So was it the same routine for a home game too? Uh, well, sometimes home games are a little different because you might have to go to class in the morning, um, just depending on what time shoot around was and you're not in a hotel, you're just waking up in your own bed. So it, home games were a little bit different unless you put in Hartford then sometimes we would um, stay the night before, but <laughs> sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, no, nothing. Talk a little bit about Hartford. Why do you play in Hartford where you have Gampel on, or Gampel on campus? And then you also have the Excel Center. So how do you divide your time? And what what's that like going from a 10,000 seat arena to like 20,000? Yeah, I believe, I believe they do it just because there's more seats in, at, um, in Hartford yeah. and to um, appeal to different crowds. I'm not exactly sure, but um, I mean, they both, you play so many games there, they both feel like home gyms. So there's really not, not much of a difference. I mean, Gamble's nice just because it's your home gym right there on campus. But I mean, it's definitely a cool environment in both of them. And, and when there's 16,000 people there, it's awesome. And also when Gamble's packed, it's awesome. So I love playing in both places and it was, it was cool. So what's your favorite arena outside of those two? Oh, wow. Favorite arena outside of those two. Mm, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, I think like going to Duke and like going to Cameron was like just a cool experience because it's so oh, yeah. well and same thing with North Carolina. Um, go to North Carolina just because there's so so much history in both of those schools that those were both just kind of cool places to walk into. Um, but obviously you just would always rather be at home. <laughs> right. Do you have a favorite game from your UConn days over the course of four years? Um, I, 
I'm going to say the game my senior year that sent us to the final four, even though I wasn't even playing in it <laughs> because I was hurt. But um, that was just such a, a big game. We were, and we were down and made a, a comeback and came back and it was just a very emotional game and being injured. And I just, it's a very memorable game. It's, it's sad being so far removed. The game, a lot of the games I remember are the ones we lost, you know, because all yeah. the kind of blend together and then there's certain memorable games but the the ones you lose of mm. course stick in your head which is awful but um but my best memory is obviously one that we won to go to the final four my senior year talk about the rivalry between UConn and Tennessee what did that mean to your team um there's just again there's just so much history and so many great players that played in that rivalry so it is definitely a high intensity game. Um, I remember being in, in Tennessee and just how loud the arena was, same thing at home, just how loud it is and how passionate everybody gets. It's, it's like, it's almost like a national championship game, just the feel of it. You know, you walk in, it's mm. just electricity. It's, it's definitely a different game. And I'm really glad that they renewed that rivalry because it's just great for women's basketball. What do you think it does for the visibility of the game too? And this is actually a lead into our next question. Where do you think the game can go in the next five to 10 years? I think over the past, you know, definitely since I graduated, women's basketball has definitely gotten more popular and it's definitely gotten more competitive. Um, I think some of the smaller programs have gotten better. I think for a while there, you had the same exact teams you know, in the final four every year. And it's still, you know, obviously you still have your favorites, but I think it's definitely gotten more competitive. And I think there's a lot more support. Um, a lot of the men's pro, uh, men's players too have shown a lot of support for women's basketball. And I think just with social media, a lot more people have voices and there's a lot more visibility on social media. So I think all of that will just continue to bring more awareness to the women's game and everything with the quality that's going on in the world right, right. now. Um, I think it's great for women's basketball, for women's sports in general. And I just think it's going to continue in that direction. Playing in the Pan American games was huge for you because you got to work with Don Staley, who was a legend. Talk about that experience. Cause that's right before your senior year, you're able to play against the best players in the world. Also your teammates with some of the best college players in the world. So what was that like for you? That was such a cool experience for me. Um, you start, you have to go to, um, the training camp and you, you have to make the team before you obviously go on the whole journey to play and represent your country. But I believe there were 48 of us that showed up for training camp and they made two different teams. So one went to the Pan Am games and the other one went to a world championship. So they kept probably 24 out of 48. So that in itself was super nerve wracking, just, you know, getting, a place on the team. So you're in Colorado Springs, which is an amazing experience in itself. You know, you go to the dining hall and there's Olympians training and all different sports and just being in that environment was a really awesome experience. So I was very fortunate. I was very happy that I made the team to start. And then once we did that, we left and we went to Brazil. So we got to, you know, experience another country, train with players from, you know, the best players in college basketball. And then Don Staley is just an amazing coach, obviously. So that was just the coolest experience. And we won the gold and just like standing up there and representing your country. It was, it was one of the coolest things I've done for sure. Being on that team with a teammate, Shardy Houston. Is that how you pronounce your name? Shardy? Shardy. 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 What mm -hmm. was that like? It was awesome. We had we had a blast. I mean, it was it was definitely nice too to have one of your teammates there with you. Um, because you know, we knew each other, we knew each other's games, and that was definitely nice to have her by my side. And I met so many other awesome girls, and we just you bond so quickly because you're together every second of every day and you're rooming together and you're in a different country together. So it's just such a quick bond. And it was an amazing, amazing time. You still keep in touch with that team? 
I do. Sometimes, I mean, it's kind of um, here and there, you know, everybody lives all over the world basically, but here and there, I definitely, you know, keep in touch with people and it's really fun to catch up with them. So speaking of teammates, let's talk about your UConn teammates. Tell us some funny stories that stick out to you from your time on UConn. Oh gosh. There's just so, it's so, you know, the thing is when you're removed for so long, yeah. uh, you just remember the times in the locker room and the, the times you guys had in the dorms together and just so many little memories that are just so fun with your teammates on a daily basis. So like everything at UConn is just we're such a family and everybody's so close knit and it's hard, you know, to pinpoint every single experience, but just day in and day out, how close of a bond we have. And even now, like I said, everybody's kind of all over the world, but every time we get together, it's like, we're nothing misses a beat and we have so much fun together. And there's the cool thing about UConn too, is just a tradition in the family of people I didn't even play with people that are 20 right. or older than me people are 10 years younger than me and how close everybody is and it's it's just it's really hard to describe that kind of um close-knit in that that family so who's the funniest from your class you've got Kenny Swainer, Brittany Hunter and Charday Houston the four of you they who all, has the swag all, and the funny um oh man I think they're they're all characters in their in their own way. <laughs> um, Brittany was probably the loudest, um, and she was always a good time. Um, Sade is definitely like the most unique out of everybody, and she was like funny without even trying to be. And then Keish was Keish is like the sweetest, nicest out of the group. And she, um, she's just always the best to be around to. Uh, what was your favorite part of going into that experience with them, especially freshman year, right? You're latching on to each other for four years. Um, what was that moment that's just, just like, okay, we're in this together. Do or die. Let's go. Cause you kind intense, right? Like those practices, there's no sugarcoating how intense Gino is. Yeah, for sure. My, for, I think everyone's freshman year is just difficult because you come from high school where you were the best player. You've done everything your way for as long as you've played basketball. And then you show up and you're not the best player anymore. And you're doing everything wrong. And there's just so many things that you have to unlearn to learn the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. so I think everybody just struggles a little bit at the beginning of their freshman year and just trying to basically relearn everything you know about basketball and relearn, relearning your work ethic and, you know, gelling with new teammates and obviously understanding coaches philosophy as well. So I think all of that was difficult. And my freshman year was, we struggled a little bit. So definitely early on, um, just having the pressure of being a freshman and the team not being as good as they'd been the past few years. Right. Um, right. I definitely think we leaned on each other for support. And I think that just makes your bond that much stronger to overcome things together grow together and just have somebody that's there for you to pick you up and say, you know, it's okay. Like we got this together. Speaking of philosophy, talk about coach's philosophy for practice. Um, what are his practices like for those who've never experienced the practices, you know? Um, the practices are very intense and very spirited and fun and competitive. So I think um, every day you walk in and you have to work for sure. I mean, you just, you, it's hard work, but everything is competitive in, and we have so much fun while we're doing it. So it's, you know, everybody's like, it, it just like, it wasn't a chore to go to practice, you know, as hard as it was, we, we were all, we all had that same end goal. And so we worked so hard together and it was rewarding and yeah. winning fun and working with your teammates was fun and it's just loud the gym's loud the whole time because everybody's clapping everybody's cheering each other on everybody's 
um, enthusiastic and it was fun. Practice was, I mean, of course there were a couple of days where you might've lost or didn't play well. And then you go into practice, it's not the best thing you've ever done in the world, but in just overall, I loved going to practice every day and I loved getting better and just, um, you know, learning from them and competing. It was, it was a blast. So talk about those traditions and practice, the clapping, and then even on the bench during games, high-fiving, um, what does that mean to your team? The thing that's really cool about it is it's never really taught. It's just part of the tradition. So you walk in, you're a freshman, you don't know anything, and you look around and you're like, whoa, is this yeah. kind of doing? And you just kind of, you know, you kind of just step in line and you, if you're not doing it, you're not doing it right, you know? So yeah. It's all of those little things as a freshman that you don't necessarily know you're supposed to do until you have the older guys that are telling you. It's not even the coaches that are the ones telling you what to do. It'll be the seniors saying, hey, tuck your shirt in. Hey, do this. Hey, touch this line. Hey, you have to go harder here. Whatever it is. Um, but it's definitely passed down from generation to generation, class to class, player to player. And that's something that's really special about the program. I love seeing all their traditions. It's super cool. So talk a little bit about your book. You're a senior in college. You're writing your journal. What was that process like for you as you were writing through your journal? Was it like, I want to write a book? Or was it kind of after the fact? Well, I went into my senior year and I was just positive we were going to win the national championship that year because we had all the pieces. That was my Morris freshman year. And we had a really, really good shot. I don't know. We were number one when I got hurt. We were undefeated. I don't know um, exactly what the preseason um, rankings and stuff were, but I know we were number one and we were undefeated when I went down like 15 games into the season. But um, so I just kind of had in the back of my head, like if we win this year, I'm going to just document everything that happened. And then I'm going to write a book about when we won the national championship. Like it's, you know, and it was kind of like, one of those crazy outside thoughts. You don't know if you're really going to do it or not, <laughs> but yeah. I, I want to, I want to have the opportunity. So I kind of just started this journal and it was this crazy idea that maybe one day if we won the national championship, I'd publish this book. And, um, I don't know. I don't know if I really ever thought I was going to do it, but I kept the journal and then I ended up getting hurt. I tore my ACL, um, halfway through the season and it definitely changed the course of the year and the course of the book, because then I had to go through my whole rehab process and watch my team. And it was just, you know, it added a different dynamic to the story. Obviously we still had a great year. We went to the final four, but we didn't win, but I decided to still go through with it and publish it because I know a lot of, you know, younger girls that play basketball might be going through injuries and the same kind of thing. And I know how much, how passionate our fans are about, UConn basketball so I just thought it might be a cool insight to the program and might be able to help some young girls but again I still I wrote this whole thing I hadn't told a soul I just wasn't sure about it it was like kind of this crazy idea like writing a book you know yeah yeah and so it was I don't know maybe in May so it was like right after our season graduation time and I asked Coach Ryan if I could meet with him. And he said, sure. So I came in and I was like, so I think I might've written a book. And he was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I think I wrote a book. Will you read it? Because I'm not really, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I think about it. I just, I just want your opinion. Okay. Yeah. Like, okay. Like he was just kind of like caught off guard because he's like, what do you mean you wrote <laughs> And so I gave him, you know, the manuscript of the book and I was like a nervous wreck. Again, I hadn't told anybody about this. So he's the only one that knows. And he was, he took, I think three days to respond. And then he wrote back and he was like, it's really good. Come in. We'll talk about it. I was like, okay. So I like got it back. I was like, Whew, okay. He liked it. That's good. So then I went in and, um, and he just kind of gave me some pointers of what he thought I should add or change or whatever. And he was really, really helpful in the process. And I was like, what do you think about this? Like, do you think people will respond to it? Like, obviously I love playing here with every ounce of my soul. So I, you know, want to show the program in a, in a good light. I'm obviously trying to 
um, promote how amazing this program is. And he was like, so he told me, you know, what steps to go through just to make sure everything was with compliance and all that kind of stuff. But he definitely helped me a lot through the process. And it, it, it was really a crazy whirlwind of events. Oh, yeah. um, getting a book published. I graduated in May. Our season was over, what, March, April. I graduated in May and then the book was out by December. So that whole process of getting a publisher, you know, getting somebody to put it all together and getting all the promotions, the marketing, everything for it in that amount of time while I was playing overseas, it was, it was really insane. And it was a really, really cool experience. It was really rewarding. And the amount of feedback I got, I was blown away. How many emails, letters, everything I got from, I mean, fans in general, but especially the young girls that I inspired. I mean, it was like, this was totally worth it. I'm so glad I was able to change. I mean, some people were like, you changed my life. I, I tore my ACL and you gave me hope and this, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, I couldn't believe that, you know, I really had that much of an impact on people. Yeah. It was, it was really, really, really cool. It was better than I, anything I could have ever imagined. Just if, just if I would have got one of those, I would have felt like that, but I got like hundreds and hundreds of, Mm -hmm. you know, letters or texts or messages on Facebook or whatever from people. And it was, it was amazing. Do you have an idea for a sequel? Because I know a lot of people would love a sequel. Well, I don't know what the sequel would be about. I mean, I've obviously done other things in my life, but I don't know. I no, I, I think I'm a, I'm a one hit wonder. <laughs> um, so with UConn, you scored a thousand points. i talk a little bit about that experience and when did it hit you? Okay. I'm the 29th player in history to do this. It was during the UVA game. Uh, there was a lot of hype around it from the media and you detail that in your book. So tell the story about that experience. I remember going into the game. I didn't know. I mean, we don't really follow our stats that closely during the year, but then you have the reporters that come up to you and say, Hey, with your next game, you'll, you're going to hit a thousand points or, you know, whatever, give you the insight of you've made this many threes and this many games. And I'm like, I had no idea, you know, until people tell you that, but I think it was one of the reporters was one of the ones that told me that you're at 995 points or, you know, something like that. So I remember going into the game and I, I think I missed like my first, I don't know, like five shots or something. And then every time the crowd was like, oh, 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 cause they all knew it too. So I remember missing a bunch of shots and being like, oh my God, they just won't go in. And then finally I got to a thousand and it was like a sigh of relief. Like, okay, I got there. And then I got hurt shortly after actually. So, I mean, it was good timing that I, that I did that before. <laughs> cause it's, I mean, it's a pretty cool milestone to hit in your, in your career. So talking about the media for a second, Megan Cuomo of SNY played for Gino. So what did it mean to have her a part of the media during your time? You know, Meg is like one of my closest friends now. That's, that's yeah. how, whole, you know, UConn family goes. She played, I don't know, maybe in 92 or something. So she played way before I did. And when I was a player, um, she interviewed me all the time and now we we joke around about the interview she was like you were so hard to interview because she was like you were just like so nervous all the time and every time I'd ask you a question you'd be like yeah it it was good it was good my team is great for me it was good Uh (laughs) yeah and so she always would just like die laughing she was like oh my gosh it was so hard to interview you because you you were so nervous and but it's just so funny now because I have such a such a cool bond with her. Um, she's like one of my good friends and I talk to her on a regular basis. So after UConn, you go to play pro, um, talk about your experiences in the pro leagues, especially in Ireland and Poland. You, I, I read somewhere that it's very different than playing in college. It most definitely is. Um, I played my first year in Ireland and then after the season, I got um, invited to go to the Seattle Storm training camp. And then I hurt my knee again and then had to have another knee surgery. So in between my first and second pro seasons, I had another knee surgery. So I never got to go to the Seattle um, training camp. 
And then I played another year in um, Poland and it's just, it, it was so, so different. I mean, it was so, it was so hard for me to adjust to because playing at UConn, you have your built-in best friends, you know, all your teammates are your best friends. You do everything with them. And then I went overseas and it was like your job. And I loved the people I played. I mean, I had a lot of great players. I played with a lot of friends, but they all had, they were in school or they had families or they were 16 and still living at home with their parents. And it was just, I had people on my team, like ranging from 16 to 36. So oh my gosh. yeah, wow. so totally different environment. I mean, I had people on my team with kids and I had people on my team that were kids. <laughs> so it was just like a totally different experience. And you would go to practice and, you know, at practice, it was cool with everybody. I, I enjoyed everybody. And then everybody just kind of went their separate ways. And I was like, uh, where are my friends? <laughs> and I was in a different country by myself. Um, in Poland, I didn't speak the language and I was just by myself a lot. And I think that kind of wore on me. Um, I had a roommate when I was in Poland and then she got sent home two months after we were there. So the rest of the season I was by myself and it was just, you know, I was just staring at the walls and I didn't know communication is different now. I mean, everything, smartphones, like I had a, uh, like a flip phone. They were like even be behind time than we were in the United States. I had like a, I went back to like the Nokia, like block phone that had snake oh on. Oh my it. gosh. So like, it was like, you know, like in love and basketball, the scene where she's just totally alone overseas. Like I felt like that sometimes. So it was definitely, um, it was definitely a transition and it was hard to go from such an elite level of playing to feeling like I regressed because my pro teams weren't as good as playing for UConn was. And so it was, it was hard for me because I felt kind of like I was chasing something that I would never get again. I would never have the same kind of experience, same coaching, same players. And so I was just, I, I kind of started to get miserable because I was, you know, chasing something that I would never be able to find. UConn is unique in that way, right? Like it's clear that UConn, there's no other UConn. It, there really isn't. And that definitely was, um, was very difficult for me. Um, and honestly, that's ultimately kind of why I got out of it just because I was like, I'm going to roll the dice again and hope I go in a place that I like and hopefully but you're stuck there for, you know, the next eight months. So after my second year of playing, I um, still had my agent looking overseas for um, more opportunities. And then I also applied to a bunch of different grad schools and different jobs in the U.S. And I was just like, whatever opportunity comes that excites me, I'm going to do. So I ended up getting an opportunity to um, get my master's and work with the women's basketball team at Florida Gulf Coast in Fort Myers, Florida. And so I ended up um, getting out of playing and into coaching. And that was my transition. But all that being said, anyone that wants to play overseas, I highly, highly, highly recommend it because on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, I was definitely lonely and, um, you know, there were things that were hard, but overall the experience was amazing. I mean, you got to live in a different culture. You got to experience another way of basketball. You got to meet people from all over the world. And I still have friends in places from all over the world. So, um, it's definitely, I mean, a really, really cool experience. And I wish in retrospect, you know, I would have been able to enjoy the experience a little bit more, mm -hmm. but for me, it was like ball is life. And there was nothing else. I couldn't go out and go to the pubs and drink and enjoy the Irish lifestyle because I was like so concentrated on basketball. And that was like the only thing I cared about. So I think if I could relive it, I would like experience the culture a little bit more. It wouldn't yeah. I would so like tunnel vision on basketball and nothing else matters. So it's kind of like basketball isn't the greatest right now. So my life sucks and I couldn't find a balance at all. And I think, you know, I've seen some of my former teammates um, have found situations where they go back every year and they've been playing for, you know, 12 years in the same country and basically have a second life over there. So there's definitely like awesome opportunities to do that. So I don't want to discourage anyone from playing over it's a really cool experience. And at the end of the day, you're getting paid to play the sport you love, you know? Right. 
I'm so glad I did it. And there were a lot of positives as well. I mean, like I said, experiencing a whole another country, another culture when you're in your, you know, 22 years old is a, is a really, really, really cool experience. And, it, you know, after our season was over, I got to travel and see the world a little bit. And it was definitely a really cool experience on, on a whole. It's kind of like studying abroad because college athletes don't get to do that that much because of their season. So if you look at it in that way, you know, you're kind of seeing the world, like you said, and then doing what you love and it's, it's epic. Yeah, it is for sure. And like I said, if, if I was, you know, today and I went back in the same exact situation, I feel like I'd enjoy it a lot more, but now I'm just much older and wiser. <laughs> uh, so at GCU is in Fort Myers, Florida, like you said, uh, what was that experience like for you going from playing to coaching, especially since you were a couple of years removed from UConn, you're able to relate to the players in that way. You're like, okay, I know what you're going through as a college athlete. And then they go to the NCAA tourney and you know what that's like. So talk about that experience. Um, it was, it was, a, again, it was kind of a hard transition because I still felt like I wanted to be playing. So it was your whole life. You kind of identify yourself as I'm Mel, the basketball player. And then one day, all of a sudden you're not Mel, the basketball player. So I think that there, there was definitely a transition there in learning how to kind of re-identify myself, I guess, and you're not the player anymore. Now you, now you're, it's your turn to help these, these people. But I think that definitely took some time to, you know, be able to step away from it. And I think it probably took a few years, to be honest, to actually realize there was more to me than just the basketball player. But that being said, um, the being part of a team, was just fell right into place. You know, you left one team, now you're part of another, you're still part of a team. And that is the best thing in the world. I mean, the bonds I have with those girls, and I'm still friends with a lot of those girls today, because I was only, you know, a couple of years older than them at the time, because I was probably 24, 25, and they were, you know, so, um, but that was a really, it was, it was a definitely a cool experience. They have a great program um, at Florida Gulf Coast. And um, it was definitely interesting to see um, at a mid-major level, just how it's different, like how going to the NCAA tournament is such a big deal. And then when you're at, um, like, you know, UConn, you kind of take those things for granted. Like, of course, we're going to go to the NCAA tournament. You know what I mean? But it was, it was definitely really cool to, um, see the other side of that. And, um, it was an awesome experience. I'm, I mean, I'm glad I did it for sure. So now we're going to go to some fan questions. Uh, some of these come from the famed website, The Boneyard. You probably know what that is, right? Yes, I haven't even thought about The Boneyard in quite some time, but yes, I'm very familiar with The Boneyard. So did you pay attention to it as a player or were you kind of like, I'm not going to go on that website? No, I never went on it, but I just heard things through the grapevine that were on The Boneyard, but no, I never went on it. You don't want anybody, you don't want to read anything bad yeah. about it. Oh, you know? <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so the first question for you is, um, and we're going to tweak this a little bit because of the recent hiring Gino made, Morgan Valley is next in line to be an assistant coach with Gino. So talk about the value of that, especially since she's a part of the UConn family. Um, I love Morgan. She was there my freshman year. Um, she was helping as like a graduate assistant or she was finishing her degree or something, but she was there my freshman year. So I got to spend a lot of time with Mo and she's very, very passionate. Um, she's very high energy. She loves UConn basketball. I mean, I think she's going to be an awesome coach for them. Um, and just, she's, a, she's just a very genuine person and she has um, such a good personality. So I think she's going to be great recruiter, great with the girls and just bring her passion and her fire, um, to practice every day. What is your favorite Gino story? Oh, geez. Um, my favorite Gino story. Oh. I don't have one off the top of my head. There were just so many, you know, on a, I, I don't have one off the top of my head. <laughs> Um, is there like a moment where he would just go ballistic or leave and like, you know, with the sarcasm, cause he's very sarcastic. Okay. I'll give you one, one, my freshman, you know, you kind of your freshman year, 
like I said, you kind of have to relearn things a little bit. So there was one practice. He told me not to shoot the ball because he said, you're not confident. You can't make a shot. So don't shoot it. So I'm like, okay, coach told me not to shoot it. I'm not going to shoot it. So the whole practice goes by and I don't shoot every time I'm open. I'm not, I'm not shooting the ball. Cause I'm trying to listen to the coach. I'm like, you know, and then at the end of the practice, he was like, what is wrong with you? Like, why would you ever, he's like, I wanted you to say, you know, screw you. I, I can make it. I have confidence in myself, like screw you. And I'm going to shoot it. So I'm like, so I'm not supposed to listen to my coach. I thought, you know what I mean? But like, now I understand like what he was doing. He wanted me, he just needed to build that confidence in yourself that you have to have in the games and you have to start in practice to, for that to translate over into the games. So, but my freshman year, I mean, I wasn't quite there. I didn't know I struggled, you know, I had to get my shot quicker. I had to, and there was just a lot of things I had to do. So, I mean, those were just some of the things that he did like as a tactic when you're, especially when you first get there, just for you to relearn. And then, you know, by the time you're a sophomore, you you would never do that, you know, cause you know, you know, to be confident in yourself, you know, um, and that translates over, over into the games. So, but I just remember being like, I was, I, I was listening to him. I thought I was doing the right thing. I was not doing the right thing. <laughs> so talk about what you're doing now. Everybody wants to know where's Mel in the world of, um, 2021. Like, what have you been up to since, um, COVID hit and everything like that? Let's see. Well, I, got married and had a baby during the, the pandemic. So that, that, was, that was a lot going on. Um, yeah, I have a, she's almost four months old now, a little baby. Oh. I'm, I just feel so blessed and it's just a whole new journey, you know, motherhood, yeah. trying to navigate that. And I, she's just the best. I just love her. And it's definitely a new, a new challenge. And, um, I, I'm just very blessed doing that. I'm, um, I'm training kids. I have a little basketball academy here in, uh, in Naples and, and then I work from home and do some marketing and graphic design. Um, but, you know, do all that kind of part-time because I'm home with the baby too. So it's definitely, I never realized how little time you would have when you have a baby, like it'll be seven o'clock and I'm like, what happened today? Like, I have no idea what I did, you know, cause you're just taking care of the baby and, but she's a blast and I'm, I'm enjoying every second of it. And my husband's amazing. And I'm just very, very happy. You think she'll play basketball? I don't know. I mean, her, her dad, my husband was a basketball player as well. So it's definitely in her blood, but, um, you know, I don't, maybe she'll be like, I like ballet. I have no idea. (laughs) I mean, I'm sure she'll be in the gym enough that, um, she'll have the opportunity to play basketball if she wants to, but whatever it is that she wants to do, she can do it. Talk about your family. Um, they've played a huge role in who you are today. Um, and a fan wants to know, how's your mom? (laughs) <laughs> my mom is amazing um she is in Cincinnati um she's a nurse so it was definitely hard for her right the pandemic and going through all that she was working in a nursing home so it was definitely a rough year but um just aside from that she's doing much but you know she's vaccinated now she's doing a lot better I think everybody in the world is you know coming out on the other side hopefully and um she's amazing. She's just, she's hilarious. Um, she's my biggest support system. I talk to her every day. She's absolutely loving being a grandma and, um, she's just great. She's the best. I'm just very blessed to have her. And the same fan wants to know about your high school. So being an alum of Mount Notre Dame and Cincy, do you have any thoughts about KK Bransford, who is an apparent UConn target for 2022? KK is awesome. I watched um, them play their semifinal game and their final game this year to win the state championship. And she got Miss Ohio basketball. Um, She's just an all around great player. And she's a really nice kid too. My high school coach that coached me is still there. And he's actually in Naples tonight. So I'm going to meet him tonight, which is random. So fun. So, 
but he's awesome. And one of my former teammates also plays, or is also um, a coach on the coaching staff. So I have um, definitely stayed in close contact with the program. And he's had me come back and talk to the kids um, a few times uh, whenever I'm home for the holidays. So I've been, since I've graduated, just been a huge fan of the program. And um, I've, you know, loved watching how much success they've had. And KK is awesome. So hopefully we get her. <laughs> so we have a connection. Do you know Kendall Hackney? Oh yeah, of course. So you- I, so my family were Northwestern fans and she obviously went to play Northwestern. So I was like, wait, not Notre Dame. Mel yeah. Thomas, what a funny small world we're in. Yeah, Kendall's amazing. She, she was such a great player. I think they won, they might've won four in a row at Notre Dame while she was there. I mean, she was um she was an awesome awesome player and she's a really 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 nice person too so that's that's an awesome little connection <laughs> did, you, did you ever overlap with her or were you at before her how many um years we were apart but she's a little bit younger than me gotcha um let's see another fan question asks um what's the much rewarding part of being a student athlete um most rewarding part um I think I don't know I mean I don't know I think it's just the day-to-day like grind for me was kind of what got me going what kind of lit a fire under me so it was just having something that you were that passionate about that really just like moved you every day I don't want to say like got me out of bed every morning every morning because that might be a little dramatic but something you know something that really just fueled your your fire and um I think just having that is is really something that you can't really put into words because once that was taken away from me it was hard for me to like navigate through life you know it was like every day I was so focused on something and having just the day-to-day grind and how much I enjoyed and loved basketball and playing. I mean, I think that's what was the most rewarding part, being able to compete, being um, just being part of a team. And like, obviously when you win and watch the success of all your hard work, that's obviously rewarding, but I just, I just really value the day-to-day grind. I I absolutely loved it. I love the process. What is one piece of advice you would give to a current student athlete like Paige Beckers or um, any of the other UConn ladies that are out there right now starting their careers? Um, I think the mental aspects, like being confident in yourself at all times, because as athletes, we tend to be perfectionists and that's kind of what gets us there. We work so hard to perfect our craft, but that can be like a curse and a blessing because you can be so hard on yourself because you want to be the best you can be. You want to be perfect and it's impossible. So just enjoying the process and believing in yourself, no matter what, and not letting your confidence waver, um, whether things are going good or bad. Uh, I think that's definitely the advice I would give my younger self to not, not be so hard on yourself, you know, be kind to yourself. Have you met any of the current UConn players before? Current, um, cool, like, I think I met a couple, like at a, a final four a few years ago, like quickly in passing, but I don't know this group as well. And like right now, um, right. But, but being, re- I mean, after graduating, there were some groups that I was around more often, but I've been in Florida and I, I've only been there back, you know, a couple times a year. So I don't know this group right now as well. I've just, you know, met people like. Right. So before we let you go, uh, there's a segment I do called Music Minute, and we're going to do a change to it. So usually I'll tell guests in under a minute to give me their favorite songs of right now. But I'm going to scrap the time limit because uh, we're going to go back a while to your college years and your favorite songs back then. What was jamming in the dorms or in Gample? What were the songs that you were always listening to? 
Oh my gosh. Okay. So I started, um, I started writing. Oh, I actually have a funny story about music. So I started writing some of these down last night and then I remembered this and I had totally forgot that this even happened. But when I was in college, um, it was when you had to download a song on the computer and sometimes it would yeah. sound a hundred years old, but you had to like wait for it to download. Sometimes it took like hours to download. You're using Napster or um, Live My Wire or whatever. So we would, you know, download our songs so we could listen to them on our computer. And then one day I got a letter um, from the University of Connecticut and I had to go to a hearing. Charday and I, because I guess we were in the same room, maybe. I don't know why it was us two, but we got a, uh, a letter for a hearing and we had to go to like multiple um, university hearings because we were like getting in trouble for downloading illegal music or something on Napster. And like, they were threatening to like throw us out of school over illegally downloading songs. So this was, that was my freshman year. So by my senior year, I was like, I will never ever download a song ever again. So by my senior year, I still had like the Disman with like the CD and that was not a thing anymore. Everybody else had iPad pop iPods at that point, but I was still carrying around like my big disc man. Cause I was like, I'm not going to get thrown out of school for downloading music. So it was like the most ridiculous thing. And I totally forgot that even happened until you asked me about music. So yeah, that was, that was almost the end of my Yukon playing days was Napster, <laughs> but okay. Back to your question. Um, some of the songs that were popular, a lot of like the, the dance songs like soldier boy, uh, crank that by soldier boy. I remember when we were in, um, Brazil with a USA team, we were all learning the dance to it by the pool out there, like in our downtime. So that was definitely the time frame of that. Um, lean with it, rock with it by them franchise boys. That was one I had, um, T pain was really big. So I'm sprung by you a drink. Those were big. It's going down young chalk um little wayne a bunch of the little wayne songs little wayne was huge at the time and um my i think it was my i stayed an extra summer after i graduated and that was like when drake came to the scene so the best i ever had by drake was i remember that because i was like when i was rehabbing my knee and listening to um to drake and that was like his first hit walk it out there's another one um lean back by terror squad sierra one two step Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and that was like when Rihanna kind of like hit the scene too. Umbrella was popular. So I, it was just, it was funny. Cause I went back in the actual charts and like, looked. Cause I'm like, I don't remember, I don't remember. My memory's not that great of remembering all these songs. And it was funny. Cause I was like, Drake just got popular. Like Rihanna just got pop, like just started. So it just made me feel really old. That's crazy. <laughs> Isn't that crazy how fast time goes? it's insane it's, it's wild like I can't believe I've been right. for that long I really just I can't believe it do you ever reread your books like do you ever just like go back in time and you know reread your memories I have not because it was a very authentic genuine time I mean that's what ever my thoughts were when I was 21 22 years old and now I feel like if I reread it it would be like looking at like a bad high school picture of you you know you see it and you're like it, it would like make me cringe at not all of it obviously because the whole experience was great but some of the things that I would say because I'm obviously I'm I would hope that I'm a lot more mature at this stage in my life than I was when I was 21 years old so I feel like if I went back and reread it I would be like oh my gosh I'm so stupid I was you know what I mean I was I was 20. Yeah. And I was, I was saying the dumbest things, but I mean, obviously there's a lot of great stuff in there, but that's just how I, you know, if I was to reread it now, I feel like I would, you know, rereading old diary entries more or less. I'd be like, oh gosh. Do you have any shout outs for people who might be listening? Cause we have a lot of listeners. We're not live, obviously this is taped, but any shout outs? Um, I'm going to shout out all the Yukon fans because it was, they were played such a important role, you know, in making Yukon part of what it is. So like every, every day, like the hard hat guys were there, people would like hold your name up, um, 
in signs in the in the stands and you know it's just like all those things make it really really special so all the fans that cheered us on and supported us through the good times and the bad times I want to I want to shout out you guys speaking of the fans you talk about this in your book you show up for a recruiting visit and they already have your name on a sign yeah, they're they're diehard. I mean, they do their research too. But it's I mean, it's definitely like I said, it definitely yeah. the environment and it really makes it special for us as players. Which I think is so cool. And I want to shout out your teammates too. Shout out to that whole squad that you played with all four years. Hopefully they're listening to this. They better be. <laughs> oh my I miss you guys. And then shout out to Coach Gino and CD and the whole coaching staff. Shout out to the current team. Uh, shout out to my grandma for introducing me to this book. This is like I said, you know, I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah, you have to tell them. She sent me a picture yesterday. And it was how old were you? Like 10 years old? 11 years old. It is the yeah. little thing. I mean, she's holding my book and she's so excited. And oh my gosh, I was cracking up. I was like, this is so cool. How it, how it comes full circle. And now you're. Yeah. So then I sent you a fan email at age 11. And I, I remember sending you the email and um, I asked you about Lauren Dixon and her love for Disney channel, because I loved Disney as a kid. I'm like, okay, if they love Disney, we have something going here. And so I remember asking you about what was on the locker room TV in terms of Disney Channel. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, what is happening? What, and I wrote back to you? I think so. I forget what you said, but you did. I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember. That is so awesome. That is so it's just so crazy. So shout out to you, Mel, for like being willing to come on. Um, your book is my all-time favorite book. Everybody go buy Heart of the Husky. I have it right here. Go buy it. It's on sale on Amazon. Do you know if it's still in bookstores too? I feel like it, right? I, I don't, I don't think it is in bookstores anymore. But this picture is so badass, by the way. Look at you go. So thank you so much to Mel Thomas for coming on. It's an honor. Thanks for having me. This is so much fun.